Welcome to the Hudson Institute. I'm Brian Clark, a senior fellow at the Institute and uh, director of the Hudson Center for Defense Concepts and Technology. Uh, we're joined today by Congresswoman Elaine Luria from Virginia's second congressional district. Uh, Congressman Luria has been in Congress since 2018, following a 20 year career in the US Navy, where she was a surface warfare officer, nuclear trained, uh, who spent uh, her time in the Navy on six different ships deploying to the Middle East and Western Pacific, uh, and culminating a career, her career by commanding a unit of more than 400 uh, sailors uh, that were combat ready and prepared for deployment. Uh, Representative Luria is one of the first women to have completed the nuclear power program and one of the first women to have uh, conducted all of her time in the Navy on combatant ships. Uh, she serves on the House Armed Services Committee, where she's the vice chair. Uh, she's also on the House Committee on Veterans Affairs and the House Committee on Homeland Security. Of all the members of uh, the House Democratic Caucus, uh, she has served the longest on active duty, uh, having served 20 years. Uh, and she graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy and has a master's degree from Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, welcome, Congresswoman Luria. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me today, Brian. Uh, so it's uh, it's a very uh, you know, tumultuous time for the Navy. Where the, the the topic today is the future of the Navy. Um, the Navy has gone through a, a relatively significant number of leadership changes over the last year. Um, near the end of 2019, we changed out the Chief of Naval Operations, and the intended Chief of Naval Operations ended up having to pull out. We got a uh, surprise uh, pick with Admiral Mike Gilday. And then over the course of 2020, we lost several secretaries, uh, an undersecretary, and now we're uh, into 2021, a new administration, and still don't have a, a named secretary of the Navy. Um, these leadership changes are coming uh, at the same time as we've had a significant number of new force structure analyses that have come out of the Navy. Uh, several different studies have led to different ship numbers, different ship mixes. Um, so there's just a lot going on in the Navy right now and not a lot of certainty. So as we go into the new administration getting ready to submit its budget for 2022, um, what are your concerns um, with, with the Navy's plans um, or lack of plans? Well, Brian, um, I agree that, you know, over the course of the last year plus, um, you know, leadership in the Navy has turned over many times. Um, and there's been a lot of uncertainty. And I'll speak from my perspective in Congress um, in trying to understand what we need to do to support the Navy and provide those resources to the fleet is that we were really lacking in a 30 year shipbuilding plan and a force structure assessment and, and understanding the direction the Navy needed to go, but knowing that there is the looming threat of China and China's you know, increased activity, um, their increased um, you know, uh, ag aggressiveness within the region and you know, in support of these um, unrecognized maritime claims and that we need more presence in the Pacific. And at the same time, you know, I was a little curious when the budget submission came last year that although we know we need to grow the Navy, we actually ask for less ships and it took Congress to put those back, including the second Virginia class submarine. And, um, you know, there's just a lot of real critical priorities that we have in understanding, you know, how we can best provide those resources to the Navy to counter, um, you know, the Chinese threat and, you know, other um, you know, requirements for presence that we have around the world. So, you know, at the end of the last administration, uh, we got the Battle Force 2045 plan. And, you know, I have a, a lot of questions about, about that plan. Um, you know, it, it jumped the number of, of ships, you know, currently in law, 355 is the goal that we're going towards, uh, but increased that number much higher and a, a mix, um, a, including, you know, unmanned surface vessels. Um, you know, that can be an aside, but, you know, really still looking forward to a briefing from the Navy on that concept and, you know, how they'll fully you know, realize um, that and, and use them in operations. Um, but, you know, what I feel is, is lacking um, is, is really an understanding of, you know, with the Battle Force 2045, um, you know, how they get the numbers that are in the plan. Um, I recently sent a letter to the Acting Secretary of the Navy and the CNO asking for additional information, like what are the inputs um, to this plan, um, understanding things like our most limiting operational plans in the Pacific, you know, what are the assumptions that we make about the capacity of the industrial base, um, about the deployment cycles of, of our ships, you know, if you, if you kind of think of their sort of in, in Navy speak, um, you know, it, we used to say it took four to make one. So it took four ships to have one ship on station permanently um, at some point, uh, you know, some geographic location around the world. And, you know, we've shifted with the Optimized Fleet Response Plan, the OFRP, to really be in a model where it takes five to make one. Um, was that an assumption used in saying the number of ships that we have um, or that we need to, to build in the future? And, you know, there are obviously things that we have to consider. You know, it's not just numbers, but it's capability and capacity, the number of VLS cells, the number of sorties that we can generate. Um, 
And without any of that information, you know, what were all the puzzle pieces that were put together and all the assumptions that were made? You know, in Congress, we're only be given, being given a number of ships. We should build this many per year. And, you know, obviously, um, it includes some questionable things. It reduces the number of large surface combatants. But how do we make up for that loss of number of VLS cells, for example? Um, you know, I'm, I'm assuming based off of, you know, other things that have been said that, you know, that is part of what the unmanned surface vessels are intended for. But it just to summarize, you know, we have a lot of questions. And I've, you know, spoken to my colleagues, Congressman Rob Whitman, also from Virginia. He's the... Um, He's the vice ranking member on the committee. I'm the vice chair. And you know, we we spent a lot of time and effort thinking about, you know, shipbuilding. It's a huge impact to the Hampton Roads area because we're building all the carriers, half the submarines. And and I think these questions need to be answered. Um, you know, really, um, and a lot more visibility needs to be put on the role that you know the Navy plays in any conflict in the Pacific. Um, and what investments we're making today and the choices we make about those kind of ships are really gonna have an impact for a generation. And you know, I think we need to do this right. Um, there's quite a few, you know, recent shipbuilding programs that, you know, haven't gone as planned or on budget. Um, you know, we can look at the LCS, um, you know, although it is deployable and it is being used for missions around the world. And actually Admiral Davidson, um, Commander US PACOM or Indo PACOM, you know, mentioned yesterday at a hearing that, you know, that platform has been useful for some of the theater engagement missions that, that are required within, um, within that AOR, it still is not fully capable for some of the missions. You know, it was supposed to have modules to do a whole variety of things, ASW and, and mine um, warfare. And, and that's the real concern because, you know, our minesweepers are very old and, you know, that was supposed to replace those, you know, aging platforms, but it's still not fully operational. Um, DDG 1000, the Ford, you know, as we go across, you know, some of our recent shipbuilding um, programs, um, they haven't really, gone as planned on um, schedule or budget wise. And so when we look toward the future, a new class of frigates and, and, and kind of how we're gonna get to where we need to get to um, with the future of the Navy. Um, those are all things that are on my mind. I probably went well beyond the scope of your initial question. No, no, that, that, that's, that's exactly uh, kind of what I was getting at is that there's a lot going on. There's a lot of questions about where the Navy's going, its plans, the rationale for its plans, um, whether they are fiscally sustainable um, in a lot of ways. Uh, so I think that you're right, that there's a, the waterfront, if you will, is pretty broad when it comes to questions about the Navy. Um, you raised a couple of things that I wanted to make, to kind of dig into a little bit. So the, the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard just released their tri-service maritime strategy uh, last year, uh, which had a lot of good parts to it. Um, I thought it was good that it emphasized competition as well as conflict, you know, raised the fact that this is not just about preparing for World War III. It's about actually winning the kind of peacetime competition and preventing World War III from happening. Uh, and it also highlighted China as the main competitor. Um, but then the, the Battle Force 2045 that came out seemed to not be well aligned with it, right? It seemed like the, the Battle Force 2045 had a, had a ship mix that maybe was weighted very much towards the high end um, that may not be affordable. Yeah, I mean, it may, they may be setting themselves up for a situation where things get cut and then what gets cut is not strategic anymore. It's just being done as a budget exercise. So, so what did you um, what did you think of the tri-service strategy, and and do you think um, did you see anything in the Battle Force twenty forty five that sort of supported it, or or what are your questions about the Navy's um, implementation of its new strategy? You know, I think that some of my questions go back to the same questions I had about the Battle Force twenty forty five. Um, you know, it is it is useful to have you know a, a plan um but without understanding at least from the role that we sit in in congress you know what the assumptions are that went into developing a plan because i think there's a lot of things that we can invest in resource wise um that can change some of those assumptions you know are there limitations in our public shipyards in our industrial base are there limitations with personnel is it you know, particularly, you know, munitions, is it training, like all, there's all kinds of things that can be influenced, other than just, you know, sort of like, here's the menu of the things we need to buy, like, we also have to operate them, we have to maintain them. And, you know, when I think about the future structure of the fleet, there's kind of three components that go into it, we need to build what we can build. And, you know, kind of in this, um, I don't want to say race, I don't want to sound like an arms race, but, you know, in this, um, you know, in our pursuit of a larger fleet and more presence in the Pacific, um, you know, we need to build more ships. We also need to maintain the ships that we have and operate them as efficiently as possible. So I can kind of touch on some thoughts that I have there. And we need to quit getting rid of the ships we have that still have operational life left in them. Um, you know, the plan, the 2045 aggressively decommissions the cruisers, some of which we've spent a lot of money upgrading in recent years. And there's always a question of, well, you know, it would just cost too much to upgrade them in a way that we could get 10 or 15 more years out of the ship. 
well, we got to really think about what's our goal. Like, do we need a lot of ships now? We can only build so many so fast. Um, so is it really smart to get rid of the ones that we have? Um, so I would really like to see a whole by whole analysis of, you know, the issues with, you know, continuing the life uh, or extending the life of each cruiser, um, what we have already upgraded them um, to do. And um, the, really we need to make sure that we can fully analyze um, whether those investments would be worthwhile in order to continue to have that capability, continue to have that, that presence. I mean, the cruiser is going to eventually be replaced by flight three DDG, um, but that's gonna take a while to bring those online. Um, and we need that capacity and um, capability of the air defense commander, um, the VL cells in the presence. And, you know, we just need to see on paper, is there life left in the cruisers and where would a smart investment would be made? And, you know, I was XO on a cruiser. I know what it's like to, to live through the decom, don't decom cycle. I mean, we had a crack in our hangar bay on Anzio that was like 14 feet long and two feet wide. The thing that just happened, I think it was on late takeoff with the fuel tank leaking. We had a very similar thing um, happen and it was, you know, due to a, you know, a ship where there had not been, you know, sort of a life cycle maintenance plan that had been implemented over the course of the life of that ship class. And so, you know, I'm also looking at, are we doing better, you know, with the DDGs and future classes of ship to make sure we have smart life cycle maintenance plans, you know, coming from the carrier world as well. You know, those things were all kind of planned out over the course of the life of the ship. And, you know, in our surface fleet at some point, we, we deviated from that. Um, but, you know, can we make investments to keep some of the ships we have longer and extend their life cycle? And, you know, there's this rumor brewing in the background and I'll say in the background, it is just purely a coincidence, but I do have this picture of a carrier behind me and it actually is the Harry S. Truman. Um, but you know, that, that is, you know, coming into the discussion again, of, you know, would, would it save money to decommission an aircraft carrier halfway through its life cycle? Um, you know, people can make an argument that, you know, I don't buy that, you know, says we'll save some money immediately because we won't spend money to refuel it. But, you know, you've, you know there's a lot of sunk costs in this carrier, 25 years left in its life. And, you know, decommissioning it is obviously, you know, it, it is not going to be a long-term money-saving proposition. Um, and by law, we're supposed to have 11 aircraft carriers. There's no intention of changing that. Um, and, you know, the Nimitz would be the first carrier to be decommissioned at the same time, you know, Ford is slow to come online, but, you know, after Ford, um, we have the JFK and then the 81, 82 that have already been purchased in a dual carrier buy. But in order to keep, you know, keep that going, um, you know, I think that, that we need to look at, and I probably could go for a long time on this, but we also need to look at our carrier deployment, um, you know, plans and, and how we're utilizing the carriers. But the bottom line is getting rid of ships when you're trying to build the Navy is, right. is not a smart decision. And I would like justification as to, to why we're planning. To, right. okay, I, I'm, glad you, that. I'm glad you brought that up. And so, because um, one of the things we looked at when uh, we worked on the future Naval Force Structure Study last year was uh, this idea that um, keeping existing ships longer was a way to sort of fill the gap because if you're realistic about how long it takes to bring a new class on, uh, the new frigate, the unmanned surface vessels, even if they're manned or unmanned, they're, it's going to, you're looking at a decade before you really got those ships out and about in any sort of realistic numbers just because of the tech development time, the building time, the design, and then the testing. Um, so if it's a decade before you get those frigates out and as unmanned surface vessels out in numbers, what do you do between now and then to try to keep your ship capacity up? And if you look at it in terms of ship years uh, of service rather than just ships in service, um, then argument, you know, then keeping cruisers around, keeping destroyers around for long enough to make that transition is really important. Um, and so you think it'd be worth it for uh, the Navy to put that money against, um, you know, maybe some you know, some sleps that make sense. So not just not slepping for the sake of slepping, but slepping ships that are in good shape and that give you that maybe 10 to 15 year window to bring on that next class of ships. I, you know, I definitely, I don't see any other way um, that, you know, we can actually grow the fleet if we are not, you know, if we're decommissioning ships at a faster rate than we're building them, the fleet right. size is going to shrink. Um, right. We're going to reduce right. our capacity and that is really opposite of what we're trying to do by needing to increase presence and a credible threat in the Pacific. I mean, we need to provide a credible threat. Um, and, you know, there, there's a lot of pieces going into this. You know, Admiral Davidson, um, Commander, you, 
U.S. Indo-PACOM just, you know, briefed us yesterday um, on the Pacific Defense Initiative. And, you know, there are a lot of pieces. It's not just ships, um, you know, a, a missile defense capability for Guam, um, such as an Aegis shore type system and other, you know, infrastructure investments uh, within the Western Pacific that will help us, you know, broaden our, our operations and, you know, ability to operate and maintain our ships and, you know, that region is very important, um, and so it's it's not it's not only ships, but you know at the same time we can't just decommission ships faster than we can build them and expect the navy to grow. The math doesn't work. You know we're both navy nukes. We can figure that out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Um, and the uh, the question about the Truman, you know, is a is a good one too. Is it? I, I don't know if have you received any briefs or any discussion about that, or is that just a rumor? Because one of the things we found in our own analysis during that last year's uh, study was that the cost savings were so uncertain that it didn't make sense to try to retire a carrier early because you don't know if you're really going to save anything once you you know think about decommissioning that carrier um, and the fact that you're you know you don't really get those savings until four or five years down the line anyway um, so the the benefit was really uncertain whereas the the operational impact was very certain um, I don't know if they, had, but have you had any discussions about that with the Navy since they, they might be resurrecting or the, since OSD might be resurrected from this idea? You know, I would say that at this point, um, it is only speculation and this is really not the first time that this has come up either right. with the Harry S. Truman or previous refuelings. It seems like, you know, when there is a discussion of finding efficiencies, um, this is one of those things that gets revisited over and over again. Um, and I'll tell you that I will fight for the same outcome as, as last year or um, last Congress is that, you know, we, we've invested a lot in our carriers and it's not time to decommission them halfway through their life. Um, you know, they play a very vital role. Um, the carrier fleet is very stressed. You know, we've actually just seen two additional carrier strike groups deploy back to back um, to, um, you know, essentially meet requirements for presence in the Middle East because of Iran's nefarious actions throughout the region. And to provide a deterrent there, we need more presence in the Western Pacific. And in order to you know, meet those requirements around the world, like reducing our carrier fleet is, is not something that I think we should consider at this point. So, so, that, gets, so that brings us kind of to readiness. And I wanted to talk a little bit about readiness. The, um, you know, the fleet obviously is having some readiness challenges now. We've got two carriers that are getting ready to do a second deployment during their 36 month operational cycle. Um, the OFRP in theory is supposed to allow for that because we would fund the readiness of those carriers during their entire cycle. Um, the Navy has not, not routinely done that. So that's one of the reasons why bringing carriers out for a second time is, is unusual. Um, do you think that you know, the, the, the idea of double pumping carriers um, is something that we can continue to sustain? Um, and if so, do we think we need to put more money into our readiness accounts to allow that to be a, a more routine op operation until the carrier fleet grows to its required level? Um, and, or is there an infrastructure investment that we need to enable that to be sustained uh, more, uh, I guess, readily? Um, because you know this might be dependent upon shipyard space and shipyard capacity. <laughs> So like all of your questions, there's multiple questions within your question. Um, well, what I would say is that, you know, when, when the OFRP optimized fleet response plan um, came about, you know, if you got the briefing from Fleet Forces Command on the slide, you know, it said surge and then in parentheses, if funded. And so, you know, what did, what did that mean? You know, if funded, I mean, that would be like an internal Navy choice about, you know, if it was funded, but, you know, we have, you say it's not the norm, it really has, become the norm. I mean, Truman did double deploy. Um, now we've seen, um, I think it's Ike and TR have both, you know, been double deployed. But I think that's missing the point of what surge was supposed to be. I mean, surge is additional capability to respond in a time of crisis or for an unplanned operation. What we are doing now is we are double deploying, I won't even call it surging, double deploying these ships to fill a gap for other ships that should have been doing routine deployments at that time, but are delayed in maintenance. And, you know, that gets to your question of, you know, the industrial based public shipyard, because that's where the carriers are maintained um, capacity. And I'll give an example of, you know, just one carrier, CBN 77, the Bush. I mean, they're in Norfolk Naval Shipyard. Um, for when the Nimitz class was designed, the first docking availability in the ship's life cycle was supposed to be about 10 and a half months. They're there for, if I'm correct, it's, it's 27 months for this availability. Um, and that, you know, was that lengthening of that availability came about because of capacity of the shipyard. And there were decisions made that there were other priorities that needed to be, um, 
you know, sort of bumped up, you know, I know you had told me that you were the commanding officer of the MTS 635, one of the prototypes, but, you know, refueling the MTSs to make sure there was a pipeline to continue to make sure we had our nuclear operators trained that got pushed up. There was a refueling of another, um, I think it was another Los Angeles class submarine. I can't remember the hull, but, you know, before that. And so all of those things led to with limited capacity at the shipyard, they needed to draw out the availability on the, the CVN 77 and, you know, still, it is still, you know, finishing that um, availability, um, which is more than two and a half times planned, you know, when the ship was designed. And so, you know, those kind of things, you know, keep repeating because of limited capacity. And I've sort of tried to think of, you know, when did we get to this point where we really couldn't keep up with carrier maintenance? And, you know, if you look at the point where we got to all nuclear carriers, I think there was, you know, when we got rid of, you know, Kitty Hawk and Kennedy and, you um, Kelly Hawk and Independence, you know, I guess those were the three that were still in service, you know, kind of when I was in Ensign and was commissioned. And, you know, once they, once we got rid of those and all of our carriers became nuclear carriers, we had less capability, less yards that could do that, that in-depth maintenance on them. And so we need to look at that capacity. I mean, we're operating an all nuclear fleet and we need to have the ability um, to maintain those carriers. And, you know, that kind of takes me to this shipyard optimization plan, that SIOP plan, which is drawn out of our 20 years. Um, and I think that that is way too long of a period for that. And I think we should make that investment for those upgrades to our shipyards to be made, to be made more quickly. And then when you look at Norfolk Naval Shipyard, which I'm most familiar with because, you know, it's the nuclear shipyard on the East Coast and it's where I've been, um, you know, during my time in the Navy. Um, there's still upgrades that need to be made just to accommodate routine maintenance of the Ford. Um, and so we really need to prioritize that and the impacts of sea level rise, recurrent flooding in Hampton Roads, you know, some of the dry docks we're using at Norfolk Naval Shipyard, you know, or dates just post-World War I. Um, and so there has been significant sea level rise. There's temporary um, sort of dams around the dry docks, basically to accommodate for any sort of um, flooding events. Um, and then, you know, they lose work days every time there's a hurricane or major weather event coming through because they have to disconnect all the services, float the ship, you know, it's uh, really not the kind of, you know, condition or modern shipyard that we should, you know, have access to, um, to maintain these carriers. Yeah, so the Biden administration is talking about um, doing a big infrastructure bill later this year. Do you see uh, public shipyards as being something that should be in the mix when it comes to infrastructure investment when we start looking at throwing a couple trillion dollars around? I would love to put that in there. I mean, yeah, it is definitely part of our infrastructure. I mean, um, you know, making sure that we can you know, maintain our ships to defend our nation is, is certainly infrastructure to me. So, um, you know, as that comes about, would you know, love to be able to be a proponent of, of including those types of projects in an infrastructure plan. Uh, yeah, another big part of the, um, the industrial base that supports uh, the Navy's readiness is the private ship repair facilities. Um, and sometimes those get lost in the shuffle because they don't deal with the big ships or the submarines. Um, and they're distributed kind of throughout the Navy. But um, so, and there, but there are some in your district, I, I think. So the, mm. I'm wondering, have they expressed concerns to you about you know, the Navy's um, ability to schedule maintenance in a way that allows the shipyard to actually plan work and get it done or make capital investments that would support, you know, being able to bring in more ships because the Navy's even noted, we have a shortage of dry docks on the East Coast within these private ship repair facilities. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you, um, do you get those kind of concerns from, from the mm -hmm. shipyards and, and what do you think the, I mean, the Navy really hasn't done a whole lot to support that other than there's a couple of grant programs out there and there's, they're trying to improve the contracting, but I don't know what their, their long-term plan is to try to get that pro public infrastructure up to speed. Do you, do you have a sense of where they should go there? Well, you know, I think there definitely is closer coordination um, between the Navy. I just went over at, to NAVC at the war room and sat down for a couple hours and, and had a long conversation about, you know, surface ship maintenance and some of the improvements and improved processes they're making in partnerships, you know, with our, um, you know, maintenance, um, providers and I was specifically focused, you know, kind of a lot on things in the Hampton Roads area because, you know, we hear a lot um, from folks in our local area um, and some of the challenges that they face. So, you know, I think that the Navy is committing to finding efficiencies in the contracting process in, you know, partnering with um, shipyards in order to ensure that the investments they make meet the needs of, you know, the Navy's future, um, you know, maintenance requirements. Um, so I think that that coordination is definitely, you know, improving and on track and I'm aware of at least one program in, in Hampton Roads that looks to, you know, hopefully increase the ability um, to use some dry docks um, locally there, there would be some dredging required for, for this additional facility. 
um, to be able to accommodate some of the Navy ships. Um, but you know, those kind of those kind of things are being worked together between the Navy um, and the other entities involved to try to increase that capacity. But level loading is kind of the biggest concern I hear from across the waterfront as far as our private shipyard partners um, within the region. And you know, think about Hampton Roads. You know, the statistic is basically one quarter of all the shipbuilding and repair that happens in the country happens in Hampton Roads. Like there will always be work. <laughs> um, and you know, what can we do to you know better level load that and predict it? And the Navy has spent a lot of time trying to. You know, this is kind of getting really in the weeds for non-Navy ship repair people, but you know, the amount of time that the basically the work package is locked down before the contract is awarded. I mean, they used to say, you know, your contract is awarded 30 days before the ship is showing up. And that's just not enough time um, for the private contractors to get their workforce in place, to you know, prepare all of the documents and plans and work packages and have all the materials ready to actually do the work when the ship shows up. So you ended up with a delay from the start. So they've tried to improve that. You know, have the work package, you know, at least 90% complete, you know, some emergent things could happen at the end of the deployment, but to have it 90% complete before the ship, you know, is going to show up at the yard. Um, and to do other things, you know, like I mentioned earlier about life cycle maintenance. I mean, if you know that if you're going to go in a tank or a void on a cruiser, um, you don't write the work package to just say open and inspect this. I mean, you're going to open it and inspect it. And you're going to find metal that needs to be replaced and things that need to be preserved. So, you know, just doing a predictive based off of, you know, previous history for ships in the class and similar tanks, you know, how many square feet of metal are going to need to be preserved or replaced and putting that in a package up front so you can truly accommodate for how long all of this work is going to take. Um, and then, you know, for any of us who've been in a shipyard and understanding kind of just the initial conditions you have to set to even do this work to get inside the tanks, if the ship is not docked, and you're trying to you know, move fuel and other fluids around on the ship and ammunition, take all of that off, you know, um, in order to do any of this work and it's hard to reach tanks and voids, you know, just setting the conditions to do the work takes time, but you know, that has to be accounted for in the timeline. So, you know, we used to say we had like a CNO avail was 12 weeks. It was just 12 weeks. It was always just 12 weeks, you know, but, but being more realistic, you know, okay, like this is the extent of the work. This is the age of the ship. This is the last time we went in this tank or the last time it was docked and saying, it doesn't need to just be 12 weeks. I mean, there's 17 weeks of work here. So let's be realistic about it and plan that. And then when you plan your operational plans or, you know, that follow on to that maintenance, like the training the ship would do and when they would deploy again, you know, just being realistic about that you know, based off of history of the ship and that type of maintenance. So they're really putting a lot of effort into that. And, you know, I'm hoping that, that we can see a payoff for that as we move forward so that we can be realistic about the timelines for the ship's maintenance yeah. and repairs and when they can deploy again. Right, and, and which kind of raises the the question. You know, one of the big issues in the past has been operational schedules change. You know, you've got an availability scheduled. Either you don't go in, or you go in late, or you go in, and you have to come out early, um, or somebody's late and you're having to wait in line behind them. All those things happen. Um, the so this idea would be to try to better align our operational and our maintenance schedules. Um, I, I think would seem to well, be the things. The OFRP should. was supposed to just do that. Like right. everyone in the strike group went in at the same time. Everyone came out at the same time. That's a real challenge for the waterfront as far as the shipyards right. go to accommodate that many ships on the exactly, exactly. The timeline. Um, so that had, I think that had flaws, of, some flaws in the assumptions as well. Right, right. So building up the infrastructure really is a kind of a key element that's not really brought out very much. When, when the Navy presents these plans, you kind of got to dig in and figure out well, what are the assumptions behind it in terms of rotation rate and ship availability. And then behind that are some assumptions about infrastructure capacity because they assume people will be able to get in and out of the shipyard on time. And workforce. I mean, there is a finite work, skilled workforce. Right. Um, and what do we need to do, you know, especially as some of that workforce ages and retires, what do we need to do to make sure that we have skilled workforce to come behind and maintain this capability of maintaining our ships? So, you know, I think that's really important. Um, to, to look at how we develop. And, you know, I mean, the shipyards have apprentice programs and, and those types of things, but, you know, at Hampton Roads, if you are a welder, an electrician, a pipe fitter, I mean, there is there is always an opportunity right. in, in the industrial base to, to find work and the employers are always looking for more people. So I spend a lot of time talking to folks at the Virginia Ship Repair Association and yeah. local partners to figure out, you know, how we can grow the, the workforce. And, you know, I mean, the fact that we can, you know, match people, especially you know, now during the time of COVID when there is higher than we had before unemployment, like how do we get some of those people who have been impacted by that, some of the skills to actually go into this work that pays really well and, you know, has an upward tra trajectory as you know, people gain skills and experience. In the right, 
Right. Well, and there's and there's also the ship building side, um, you know, where they've got demands for similar skill sets, um, you know, in a lot of ways. But of course, the, the training and the preparation is more extensive, maybe for the ship construction side, because they've got to deal with a lot more, um, you know, if you're building nuclear ships, for example, versus repairing conventional ships. The um, so the shipbuilding side, you expressed the concern about the fact that the uh, Navy had submitted a budget with only one submarine in it last year. Um, so going forward, you think one of the major considerations that should go into the shipbuilding plan is having the stable industrial based demand signal. Um, so you don't have this need for workers to kind of leave the shipbuilding side, go to work in the ship repair side, and then come back, you know, try to float. Um, Cause that seems like when I talk to people down there, that's a lot of what happens is people are floating between shipbuilding and ship repair. So, so you think the ship pl shipbuilding plan should really have this baked into it from the start. Right. I think a constant demand signal is the most efficient way, um, both for cost and timeliness of building the ships. Um, and so if we can keep that demand signal, you know, constant, you know, building two Virginia class submarines a year. And, you know, we're not just talking about, you know, the Virginia class submarines that's between, you know, Newport News and Electric Boat, but you've got the DDG program between Pascagoula and Bath and, you know, the other programs um, that we have, you know, and that is also, it's not just the work in the yards, but it's the supplier industrial base. Right. Um, you know, there are unique components. Some of them are long lead time. Some of mm -hmm. them are very large, very expensive and take a long time to build um, that go into these ships. And so, you know, we need to make sure that we keep a constant demand signal for those items because, you know, to some degree, sometimes the Navy is the sole customer for these right. items. And if the Navy doesn't need to buy them and have a projected timeline that they're going to buy them on a routine basis for the new ships they're building, you know, that business, which today could be the only business left that makes shafts or propellers or a particular type of, of pump or, or component that's very unique. If they go out of business, you know, where are we going to go to find, you know, those, those things that we need that are critical to our ships to build them and then later on, you know, to, to repair them. Um, so I think that that is an important aspect as well that we, you know, keep a steady demand so that when we need to buy those things, there's somebody out there that has the skills and the equipment to, to make them for us. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's very important as well within the nuclear industrial base. Right. I mean, there's a very limited supply of you know, who um, you know, enriches the, the, the fuel and builds the fuel cells for our submarines. And you know, if, if that is either accelerated too quickly or stopped too quickly, then you know, that whole workforce um, is a very, very unique skill set. Um, and we need to make sure that we just have a steady demand. That yep. for all of these components that go into our shipbuilding and ship repair. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think Eddie Chang has been in the position of having to, <laughs> on an older ship, as I have been, and I think yeah. you have been too, is having to get a part that doesn't exist anymore. And you got to yeah. get it off a decommissioned ship. Or, uh, ships or yeah. um, have a crazy story that when I was on Enterprise, a, a component that had actually been sold through DRMO in the 1980s, and they tracked it down and bought it back from a guy who had in his barn in Iowa. That's very rare, um, and that's not how we should be operating. And, and I don't want to imply to anyone listening who hasn't done this for a living yeah. that that's what we do most of the time. But you know, when a ship is fifty years old and the products are obsolete, and the company that made them has long gone out of business, right. you know, sometimes you'll go to any extreme to get the component that you need um, that is suitable for use on the ship. So. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about the future of the Navy, but first I did want to ask about you have a lot of sailors in Hampton Roads, uh, obviously. And um, one of the things that we've seen with the with COVID, uh, we've extended deployments because folks have to go into quarantine before they leave and then after they come back so they can be ready to redeploy if necessary. Um, and then also when they're on deployment, they can't pull into port, they can't do a lot of the normal things that we would do to try to yeah, get people a chance to get off the ship. Um, how, um, so how are you, how do you get the, do you get the, the impression that the, the fleet is handling this, this operational tempo and COVID, the combination of those things well, uh, or are we starting to see some fraying um, at okay. this point? Well, I will say they've gotten through it. And, you know, I mean, to imagine that on a you know, smaller surface combatant, a DDG or a cruiser that you could go an entire deployment without a port visit is just, you know, really challenging. I mean, that, that is tough, really, really tough on those crews. And, um, you know, they, Call, they responded when the nation called and they, they got through it in a very tough time. Um, and I would say that it's certainly not sustainable. I mean, we cannot continue to operate that way. Um, you know, we're getting the vaccines to our deploying, um, you know, sailors and, and troops that are going, you know, overseas. Um, but we really need to make sure that, in my mind, everyone needs to get the vaccine. It hasn't been made mandatory, but in order for the military to continue to operate, you know, in uh, an environment where COVID is not a, a major risk, um, I think the responsible thing for 
sailors and soldiers to do today is to choose to get the vaccine. And I think, you know, once some hurdles with, you know, FDA approval are, are crossed, the DOD needs to make it mandatory um, in order to continue to serve. I mean, we all had to get the anthrax vaccine back in the day. You know, I mean, these things, I mean, they're, they're important to military readiness. And when you serve, that there are certain, I think, choices that you should give up in order to continue to, you know, serve in your health and the health of the community health of, you know, uh, the Navy as a whole is important. So I think that the vaccine should be given to all sailors once it's fully approved by the FDA and it should be mandatory. But the, this just can't continue at this pace and then the way it has had to bend. There have been additional demands on sailors. I haven't seen any you know, statistics yet about you know, whether this has impacted retention, but you know, when I stopped to get gas at the Wawa on Hampton Boulevard, I occasionally talk to, you know, I talk to sailors and you know, I can see on their ball cap, I was like, you just got back from another deployment. And they're like, it's been really rough. You know, I don't know if I'm going to re-enlist. And you know, you, I have the anecdotal, you know, evidence that you know it's it's tough on sailors. It's tough on their families. And you know, hopefully, um, we can kind of get through and get out of this, you know, additional strains that are caused by COVID um, because of the vaccine. Um, and you know, encourage folks to continue to serve. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a dip in retention, you yeah. know, after this year. But at the same time, you know, when there's increased unemployment, then maybe you know there there's not as many Maybe. opportunities drawing people out of the Navy. So it could it could balance out and you know not really have an operational impact. And you know, the Navy has actually had, you know, had to be very adaptive and quick to you know keep the throughput with boot camp and you know getting new sessions in their training programs for critical skills to get people out to ships. Um, you know, early on in COVID, there was just like a stop movement. No one moved. Um, and you know, that was a big strain on families as well. And I was really concerned about people in our community who, you know, in the middle of a move, like here's your orders, move out of your house, you have nothing but your suitcase and maybe your car to drive to your next assignment in San Diego, but stop, you can't go anywhere. Um, you know, it just took a lot, a lot of fronts to accommodate everything that happened very quickly because of COVID. And I know and the Navy leadership I've spoken to is very very concerned about the, you know, the personal human toll and toll it's taken on the families. And I know we're trying to mitigate that and, you know, work, work through that as we kind of come to the other side of this pandemic. Yeah, you bet. And, and one, well, so longer term, one of the things that the Navy has to do is to grow because part of the reason we have a high op tempo today is that, you know, the Navy is not growing and to the degree it has grown, a lot of the new ships, as you mentioned, haven't really been deployable. You know, Ford hasn't done deploy deployment yet. The LCSs, except for a few exceptions, have not deployed, even though 20 have been delivered. Um, the Zumwalt's have not deployed. So you've got ships coming into the fleet that aren't really making a difference in the deployed presence. So leaving the rest of the fleet to do more work. Uh, and then we've got you know demands overseas. So the, the world gets a vote, obviously. Um, so as we move into the future, you've expressed you know a, a desire to keep ships around longer. With these new classes of ships the Navy's building, there's been a tension between them and Congress on getting the required you know, technological development done in advance before the ship is fielded. But that delay will cause the, the growth of the Navy to slow. So what do you, how do you think the Navy should grow the Navy um, and still try to you know, evolve to bring in these new capabilities? Well, we've got to get this right. I mean, if you think about the four new major technologies that were employed on Ford, which includes the weapons elevators, the um, dual band radar, the catapults and the arresting gear, and the fact that, you know, there was not extensive prototyping done um, of the weapons elevators um, ahead of you know, the construction of the ship. Um, so if you take a chance on that one thing, I mean, without weapons elevators, you know, if a carrier that can't use its magazines and get, you know, its weapons up to the flight deck to arm the aircraft, it doesn't matter how many sorties per hour you can do if you can't arm the aircraft. You know what I mean? So it's a key component to the operability of the ship. Um, and so, you know, I think the Navy has acknowledged that, you know, additional prototyping and testing of that would have been, you know, would have prevented some of these delays. And, you know, also knowing that on the Kennedy, um, the lessons learned from, you know, how the aircraft elevators were installed and then the operational testing that has ensued on Ford, I think will prevent similar things from happening on the JFK. Um, but at the same time, you know, when we look at future ship classes, you know, I don't think that we should just start building something before we fully designed it. And then you, you always get in this habitual, you know, back and forth between is it the Navy's fault or the contractor's fault? I mean, if you give the contractor plans that are only 50% complete and you say, go build this, they just go build what you gave them the plans for. And then you want to put things on top of it that like don't fit just right. Well, that takes time and money to change it. And so I think on both, you know, the contractor side and the Navy side, you know, it, it depends. It depends on the circumstances, but like the Navy's responsibility is to provide the shipbuilder uh, a plan for to build something that they have 
enough confidence in that it's going to operate properly and whether that requires prototyping certain systems. I mean, you know, something that's really important that we haven't really emphasized a lot is like continuity of the same types of systems across different classes of ships. You know, the more, the more you have a commonality of parts and pieces, first of all, that makes the supply chain easier. It makes the operators understand how to operate that equipment, you know, whether they're on a DDG today or a cruiser tomorrow, it has a similar, you know, whatever the system is, lubal purifier, everybody knows how to operate it. Um, but, you know, as we build new classes of ships, you know, introducing and even consistency across a class of ships, we haven't been very good at maintaining that either. Um, so, you know, I think that we need to do better on our next classes of ships. If we're going to invest money in new ship classes, we need to understand, you know, that the technology is, is de fully developed and tested um, because it doesn't do any good to build the ship and have it not accomplish the mission ever. I mean, that's kind of where we are with the LCS. I mean, we never got to the point where these mission modules were employable. And we found other uses for the ship, which are really kind of low end uses for that platform. Um, yet we've sunk a lot of money into these mission modules, mine warfare being really the most concerning because we don't have a substitute capability for it. So, you know, I think that we need to more fully have more fully mature designs going into new ship classes in the future. Um, yeah, and then arguably um, having that more mature design in the end results in that capability being delivered earlier. I mean, we've seen mm -hmm. with these previous classes that, yeah, the ship showed up earlier, but the capability never showed up. So in the end, that two or three year delay in, in designing the ship may have been well well served. I mean, we may have been better off had we taken that time because then we would have had a capability delivered in a more reasonable period. Right, and so, I mean, a couple things on that note specifically and something I'm very enthusiastic about and, um, you know, really wanna explore, you know, the possibility of building more of the, um, you know, Coast Guard national security cutters. Um, I know that they have played a role um, in deploying to the Western Pacific and there is capability for that size of platform. It, and truly, the Coast Guard has specific roles that they have in, you know, enforcing, you know, illegal fisheries and, and law enforcement capability that is unique to the Coast Guard operating that vessel. But just understanding, you know, the ability to op to, to add more platforms of that size with a smaller crew that that with a shallow draft, you know, since we got rid of the OHP, the FFG7 class, we really haven't had a suitable ship of, you know, this lower draft that can operate, you know, kind of in coordination with some of our um, partners who have smaller navies. And um, so I, I think that we need to look at that, you know, both the capability or possibility for that to operate within the Navy and certainly increased um, within the Coast Guard. So I'm now on the Homeland Security and Maritime and Transport, oh. uh, yeah, Maritime Security. Um, subcommittee there, so we'll definitely be, you know, looking to talk to the Coast Guard a lot more about, you know, that, that those platforms. And, um, I think that's great. Um, so the that new tri-service maritime strategy highlighted the the fact that the competitive uh, phase is really important, and the Coast Guard has a role to play to that in that that is greater than that of the Navy, maybe. And we saw with the West Capella incident, you know, the Gabrielle Giffords did a great job of pushing back on Chinese aggression or Chinese assertiveness there. Um, so the Coast Guard could be a bigger player, and I know they have been integrating more closely with Indo-PACOM, so it's encouraging to see that. So yeah, building more of those kinds of ships would be a clear way to do that. Um, the um, uh, in the other part of the, the, before we wrap up here, the other part of the, the new fleet of these unmanned vessels, um, and <laughs> which every, they get a lot of attention. <laughs> um, we've paid a lot of attention to them. We had lots of debates inside the future Naval Force Structure Study about them. Uh, do you think the... Um, so what do you, do you think the unmanned vessels will be able to you know, really take on a role that helps the fleet address its capacity limitations? Or do you see them as being something that's really additive and provides a complementary capability, but it's not going to address the overall fleet size problem the Navy has? I don't think it addresses the overall fleet size problem, um, but we should probably reference our earlier conversation that I don't understand fully all of the inputs that they use to make the Battle Force 2045. Um, and secondly, I am eagerly awaiting the brief from the Navy um, to the Sea Power Subcommittee about the, um, their plans with unmanned surface vessels. And I would say that I'm not alone as a member of Congress. We really don't understand where the Navy's going with this. Yeah. Um, you know, have some ideas of you know, kind of the uses that they could be planning, but really haven't had a clear mm -hmm. brief um, on this is what we want. Is it more VLS cells? Is it ISR? Is yeah. it, you know, what, what is it you're trying to accomplish? And if so, what capacity are you making up for in the fact that in 20, Battle Force 2045, you actually reduce the number of large surface combatants. So I can only presume that you think you're gonna add some VLS cells through adding these unmanned surface vessels. But are we gonna be in a situation where this is like LCS, you know, it's gonna be 20 yeah. years from now by the time we have this hull form and this thing that can operate independently and we get through all the operational challenges of it. 
um, or do we need to find other ways to create that capacity a lot more quickly? Um, and I have some thoughts on that too that maybe we can talk about another time. <laughs> you bet. Um, that would be that'd be great. Uh, we could follow up on that. But it, yes, because I think the unmanned vessel part of it is an interesting element of the future Navy. It, it's not fully baked yet. Um, and we had a lot of debates inside the future naval force structure study about it. So um, definitely yeah. something worth considering. The for biggest us. thing that I'm concerned about off the bat, and no one has really been able to explain this to me yet, is um, you know you can assume that you know in a conflict with China, you're going to end up operating a GPS denied environment. Yeah. So if you're going to have an unmanned vessel and it <laughs> does not have GPS navigation capability, and you also have other restrictions on you know communicating directly with it from another platform because you obviously don't want to give away the position of the other platform that it's tethered to, you know how how is it useful? Like how is it going to be operated remotely? So um, you know I've just love to know more about the operational concepts for these unmanned vessels before I make a decision on you know whether I think they'll be useful tools for the Navy. Yeah, in the wargaming, we found that there were a lot of difficulties trying to make a CONOP that would work against a capable adversary um, because the you've got GPS denial, you've got the fact that when you deploy them, if they stay with the battle group, they slow down the battle group. If they deploy on their own, they become a target or an indication that you're getting ready to fight. There are all kinds of problems in terms of trying to use them in a way that gave you what you needed, the VLSLs, but didn't you know, give you a vulnerability at the same time. Um, so yeah, that, that the con ops are gonna be a key element of it. And when, do, when are they manned and when are they unmanned? Is that right, well, and I think that understanding the con ops and what you're gonna use it for is pretty important before we decide to spend money in building it. Right. I don't have any problem at all continuing to, you know, do a modest investment in research and development because I think the technology is important, you know, unmanned and automated, you know, vehicles, whether they be surface, subsurface, you know, unmanned vehicles on our streets and, and in our communities, all of that is good technology that we can benefit from. But I'm not really enthusiastic about starting to actually build these platforms until we understand what they're right. doing. and have them replace something that exists today. I mean, that's a you know the the, the counterpart to that is we would be de decommissioning something and then using this to help augment the resulting loss of capacity, which is probably premature uh, until we get those con ops nailed down. Um, well, uh, Congresswoman uh, Luria, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, it's been great talking with you. Uh, hopefully we can have a follow on conversation. We could talk more about this uh, future of the Navy uh, stuff and unmanned vehicles and how they're going to roll into it. Um, but uh, it's been great talking to you uh, today about the future of the Navy. And uh, hopefully we will get some clarity uh, as we go into posture season and we maybe get a secretary of the Navy and some actual published documents about the Navy's plans. Uh, but uh, it's been great talking with you, and uh, I want to thank you for being here today, and um, enjoy uh, the rest of your posture season, and uh, uh, thank you very much also to Sarah Russell for uh, doing the uh, producing today. Uh, have a great day. Great. Yeah, thank you for having me.